Let's stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Ask God to bless our time together today. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all of the benefits and blessings that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for a nice warm church to come worship you today. God, we thank you for your word that teaches us and instructs us. Lord, we thank you, God, for homes to live in and cars to drive. Lord, you are so good to us. I don't ever want to become unthankful, but God, I want to take a minute to thank you for your blessings. It's an honor and a privilege to come into the house of the Lord. We praise you. God, for the privilege and honor of being able to seek you, being able to gather together with like-minded people, God, that we can worship you and learn of you. God, I pray that you would bless our time together today. Bless our Sunday school teachers and our children. God, help them to learn of your word and fall in love with your truth. God, bless the adult class today. God, let the anointing be upon this teaching today. God, I pray more that you open our ears and our hearts, God, to hear and receive from you. God, help us, Lord, in our time together to offer up a praise and a worship that is satisfying and fulfilling to you, God. In the name of Jesus, we praise you, Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord in song.
close. He is intimate. He's available. He is here. And you can know him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's not a great thing that we know who he is. He's the God of the universe. We often know his name. Yes. But he knows us. Yes. He knows my name. He knows yours. He knows every hair on your head, every freckle on your face. He knows everything about you. Yes, he does. And he loves you. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that great are his thoughts towards us. It says that his thoughts towards us are more numerous than the sands of the sea or the stars of the sky. And not only are his thoughts numerous, but guess what? They're good. Yes. They're good. Sometimes we look at people and we think, oh, they don't like us. They're talking about us. They're gossiping. They're angry at us. They're mad at me. Uh -huh. The Bible says God has innumerable thoughts. And they're good. Come on. If you wonder how God feels about you, the Bible says he loves you. He thinks good about you. All right. He thinks good about each and every one of us. I'm so thankful that God knows us and loves us. Amen. You can be seated this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to have Brother and Sister Reinhardt with us. They're going to be preaching and ministering in the second service today honored to have them with us. We're going to continue in our Sunday school lessons this morning. Today we're going to cover Revelation 15 and 16. Uh, 15 is a short chapter. We'll breeze right through it. And then 16, uh, we're just going to summarize what the plagues are and continue moving on. And we're almost at the end of Revelation. So I hope that this has been a blessing to you and that you are learning some things from the book of Revelation. Again, this is not with the intent to make it an end-time prophecy series. It is not to try to tell you who plays what part or what world figure it may be or what countries it may be or give you a timeline of events that may be happening. But this is just to understand some of the book, the, the symbols and the types that John used. And also just to kind of let us know what we might be expecting when we could be raptured out of here. I know that there is great debate over the rapture, when it will take place. Uh, some believe that it's pre-trib, some believe it's mid-trib, some believe that uh, it's pre-wrath, some believe that it's after the tribulation. And then there are some that believe that the, the book of Revelation is history and, and, and that we're uh, you know, living in, in some other time frame. And, and so there's lots of different ways to interpret the book of Revelation. As I've said many, many times as the pastor of this church, I teach and preach a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe it's a biblical stance. I believe that it's probably the most accurate stance. If I'm teaching it, I honestly believe that, right? All right. But, I, <laughs> but I'm not here to argue with those that disagree because at the end of the day, we all use the same scripture to prove our point. What I will say, and I've said this over and over again, if we end up going through the tribulation, if we end up seeing the Antichrist, Revealed. Do not lose faith in the word of God because it wasn't the word that was wrong. It was my interpretation of the word. Right. A lot of people, that's their biggest argument that I've heard. I've had some people come to me even since we've started teaching this. Not from here, but people that have watched online. And they said, well, Brother Wedding, what if we go through the tribulation? You're setting your people up to lose faith in God because you told them we were going to be raptured before. No, I've told you almost every week. Mm -hmm. If we go through the tribulation... I was wrong, not the word. Mm -hmm. right. You can stand on the word even if I'm wrong. Right. That's what we got to understand, church. There's a, a great apologetist that passed away a, a year or so ago, and there's been a lot of accusations come out against him now. Now, this was a man that was world-renowned. Every Christian faith revered him for his teaching. And now they're coming out and finding that he was living a double life. But you know what? That doesn't disqualify the word. That's right. Because even when men fail, the word will stand. And yes. we got to make sure that we understand, yes, we honor the ministry. But we put our faith in the word of God. Yes, right? The it. word of God will stand when men of God fall. And so we have to be true and faithful to the word of God. But in my study and all the things that I have seen, I believe and I teach a pre-tribulation rapture. And so that's the stance that we're coming from. When it's going to happen, I don't know. But I want to be ready. I want to be ready. All right. So what we are reading uh, in Revelation, by the time we come here, 
we are getting ready to wrap up the seven-year tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. The church has already been raptured. We are in heaven. We will see that in Revelation 19. We're going to read about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when Jesus comes back, we are with him. And so we'll, we'll see that later. But now we are in Revelation 15. And John is seeing these visions. And where some people struggle in reading the book of Revelation is they read it like it's in consecutive order. Yeah. And it's not. John sees some visions, and then he has other visions that interpret what he just saw. Or he has visions that give him a summary of what he's about to see. Anybody that's read a book, watched a movie, think about when you're watching and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a scene and it cuts away to a different scene. And that scene explains the scene that you were just in. And had you missed that little cutaway, you would not get the full effect of what you were watching. And so it cuts in and out and it explains each other. And that's what you're seeing happen in the book of Revelation. So you have to understand that some chapters are not repeated. It feels like it is sometimes. But it's not repeated. It's just that some chapters are saying this is what's going to happen four chapters down the road. And we just wanted to give you a sneak peek, a preview. And so we're going to get into some of that and understand where we're at in the timeline today. In Revelation 15 and 1, John said, And I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven, having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. So these plagues that we're getting ready to see, we'll see them in Revelation 16, are the totality of God's wrath. The word used here is um, edeles, which, which means that, that it's reaching for an end or for an aim. So in other words, what we're about to see is not just God letting off steam. He's angry. He's just, you know, aimlessly pouring out wrath. But God is accomplishing his will. God is going to use this wrath to accomplish his eternal purpose. What we need to understand that even God's wrath is holy. Even in his wrath, even in his punishment, God is holy because he's not pouring out his wrath with a vendetta, but his wrath has always been to get people to repent and to extinguish sin. Right. And God's wrath is always preceded by abundant mercy, abundant mercy. And so we have seen the mercy of God throughout the ages. We have seen how God showed mercy to the elect, the, the, the Jews that were left during this time, and they were able to believe in Jesus, and they were able to uh, refuse the mark of the beast. So even in tribulation, God showed his mercy to the Jews, and some believe that there's room that if you were a Gentile and never heard the gospel, and you never rejected the gospel, that there could be a slight chance for you to be saved in there. What we've got to understand is there is no second chance for those who have heard the gospel. I know there's teaching out there and there's a series out there left behind. Tim LaHaye and many other people, they teach that if you miss the rapture, you have a second chance as long as you don't take the mark of the beast. That's not what this is. There is no second chance for those that have heard the truth. If you miss the rapture, you have missed it all. Right. 2 Thessalonians talks about that they would receive a strong delusion because they, were, they did not love the truth. Right. For those of us that miss the rapture, we will believe or we will receive a strong delusion and we will not be able to be saved. If we heard the truth and we rejected it, Paul said that there would be a strong delusion sent and right. we would not even be able to receive the truth. Right. All right. So this is not a second chance teaching. When we see people being saved, when you hear about tribulation saints, that is God turning back to the Jewish people and giving them a chance to acknowledge him as Messiah. All right. They know him as the Messiah. They know him as the king. They are part of the, the kingdom when he rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. They will see him as the king they expected him to be the first time. But the church, we know him as the bride. Right. 
We are his bride. He is our husband. They will know him as king, but we know him as husband. So when you read those things, when we talk about tribulation saints, remember we're talking primarily about Jewish people of every tribe, nation, and tongue. There are Jewish people in every nationality today. So when it talks about tribe, nation, and tongue, that's them. Just a summary before we move on. Remember the dragon or the beast, he was making war against the woman and her seed. Who was the woman? Israel. So who is her seed? The Jewish nation. It's not the church. All right? So just remember those things. All right. So in verse 2, it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, verse 3, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, some interpreters have said that this sea of glass mingled with fire is a representation of the word of God. If you go to Exodus and you read about the labor that they would wash in, in the tabernacle, the, the labor was made with glass and it was reflected because if anybody is going to wash, they first have to see themselves. If anybody's going to repent, we first have to see ourselves in light of the word of God. Once we see ourselves in light of the word, then we can acknowledge that we have been wrong and we need to change and we need to repent. And so the word of God washes us, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.26, that we are washed with the water of the word. And it's part and it's a type of the, of the labor that was in the tabernacle when they would go up. All they could see was themselves and they could see the garments that they had on and they would see the blood that was upon them and they would go and they would walk. And so some scholars believe that what we really could say is that those that had overcome the beast were found standing on the sea of glass. What we could say is they were standing on the word. Okay. Think about that. They overcame him because they were standing on the word. Right. If we're going to have victory in any area of our life, we are going to have to learn to stand on the word of God. Yeah. If you want victory when your church is splitting, you need to stand on the word of God. If you want victory when your spouse is walking out the door, you got to stand on the word of God. If you want victory when your child is in jail or strung out on drugs, you got to stand on the word of God. When the doctor says we found a tumor and you've got cancer, you got to stand on the Come word of God. When you have bills coming in and no money to pay, you got to stand on the word. They overcame because they stood on the word of God. Yes. Amen. They sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb are the same song. It's a both a song of deliverance. When they sang the song of Moses, they had just been set free from Egypt. And Miriam and the singers and the dancers got their timbrels and they began to dance. And they sang about their deliverance from Egypt. And Egypt is a picture of our sin. To sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb represent the Old Testament and the New Testament, the covenant of God, and how he has delivered. Right. And we sing that song today because we have been delivered and we sing about his greatness. Amen? Amen. Verse 5. It says, and after that, so he saw this picture in heaven. He saw those that had overcome the beast, and they were standing on the word. And he said, after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle uh, of the testimony in heaven was open. Now, what he's referring to here is what we call the Holy of Holies. He's talking about the Holy of Holies because he's seeing where the Ten Commandments were kept. And we know that they were kept in the ark, which was kept in the Holy of Holies. So he's seeing a picture of the Holy of Holies. Church, what we have to understand is that judgment comes when we continually reject God's word. When we continually reject his word, judgment will come. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, God did this to me. God did that to me. No, no, no. 
God, the Bible says, the goodness of God leads all men to repentance. But when we disobey, we open ourselves up to reap what we have sown. If you go out and you overdose on drugs, you can't say that, you know, that God did this to you. Or if your child did that, you can't say God killed my son. No. God did not stick a needle in your son's arm and make him pass away. God did not do those things. We are living in a world of sin. And if we choose sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Is death. So we reap what we sow. But God is merciful. And if we repent, we can turn from him. And God is long-suffering and not willing that any should perish. So while we're talking about judgment, what we've got to understand is the reason we are still here is not because we're waiting for a prophetic fulfillment, but the Bible says that while some think God has forgotten his promise to return, the reason he has not come back is because there are still lost souls. There's still a mother or a grandmother or a pastor or somebody praying, God, give me one more day to reach my loved one. God, give us one more day for revival to bring. Yeah. The reason he has not come back yet is because he doesn't want anybody to be lost. Right. His mercies are new every morning. But there is a day where judgment will be released. If we continue in a life of sin and disobedience, there will come judgment if we do not repent. And so that's what he's seeing as judgment poured out. But again, as I said, it's coming from a holy place. It's not God saying, well, I'm going to get you, you little dirty dog. No. God pours out judgment because he's trying to extinguish sin. When God deals with man, he deals with us through his word, through his spirit, and through the man of God. Right, right. If we refuse those three voices, then God will allow circumstances to come into our life. He will allow us to reap what we sow so that maybe our circumstances will turn us back to God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians that uh, when, the, when the person in the church refused to repent, the fornicator that refused to repent, he said, put them out so that they may be given over to Satan for a while, that even though they suffer in the body, their heart might be turned back to God. Right. Sometimes God uses our suffering when we turn a deaf ear to every other voice he's tried to send us. I've said it before, God cares more about our salvation than he does our comfort. Yeah. Right. And so he'll allow us to lose our comfort if it will lead us to repentance. Right. Right. But it's not God with a lightning bolt up there waiting to get you. Right. That's not how God works. Right. Chapter or verse 6, it says, And the angels came out of the temple, and having the seven plagues clothed in pure white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles, and one of the four beasts that we saw in the very beginning of our study, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke and from the glory of God and his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now what that is a picture of the Bible is teaching us that there was no intercession made. There was no stopping the wrath. Once he started pouring out the plagues, there were no prayers prayed that could stop it. Because his, the, the temple was filled, no one could enter his presence and make intercession. Church, there are times where God is going to do what God needs to do. Right. Where he just needs to do it. There's loved ones that I have prayed and prayed and prayed. God, show them mercy. God, give them grace. And I, I pray, Lord, bless them. Lord, you know, draw them in and, 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 you know, show them how much you love them and do all these things. But you know what prayer God answers? The prayer when I say, God, put rocks in their bed. Yeah. Keep them awake all night, God. Make them miserable. I have prayed for my loved ones. And I don't mean this in a mean way, but my wife got after me one time. She said, honey, that might have been a little harsh. Because I pray, God, give them dreams and let them feel the flames of hell. And let them smell the smoke. Let them smell the sulfur. Make them uncomfortable. She 
said, I don't know what you're praying for me that way. <laughs> I'd rather have them dream about it than live in it. Right. Yes. Right. Oh, right. Amen. And so while sometimes we pray God shower them with blessings, God's saying, you know what, blessings didn't work, but I love them enough. Now I'm going to keep them awake at night. Now I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to convict them. We had a foster son that lived with us, and he called me one time when after he had moved out, and he said, Dad? I said, yes. He said, stop praying for me. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, I know what you're doing. I haven't slept in a week. Stop. I said, come back to church, and I'll quit. <laughs> Sometimes God just has to do what he has to do. Right. And we can pray and we can intercede all that we want. But if God wants to accomplish something, we will not be able to detour him from accomplishing that. Right. So we got to understand that sometimes God says, okay, I've tried every other avenue. Now we're going to get their attention. But it's not because God's angry. God loves them. Right. All right. Chapter 16. Now... So John had seen this summary of what was going to happen. Now he describes what happened in more detail. So in Revelation 16, verses 1 and 2, he said, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first one, uh, in verse 2, went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men, which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. So the first vial, or the first plague, if you will, was sores that came upon those that worshipped the beast. And one thing we have to understand is these sores, we'll read later in this chapter, did not disappear. It wasn't just a sore they had for a day or two. These were sores that they had for the rest of their life. All right? Now, this is similar to the sixth plague that we saw in Egypt in uh, Exodus 9, verses 8 through 12, when the Lord put boils upon the Egyptians when he was trying to get Pharaoh to let Moses and the Hebrews go. It only fell on those who worshipped the beast, and they did not disappear. So though, that was the first plague. The second plague in Revelation 16 and 3 said the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel, so the second angel affected the ocean, the sea, the salt water, all right? The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water, fresh water, water that we would drink, water that we would see in Indiana, not at Myrtle Beach. And so all of the water between the second and the third angel were affected. And he said, they became blood. So we see this in previous ones. Remember we talked a few chapters ago how sometimes when we see it, we've seen some of this stuff happen in previous chapters, but it was on a lesser degree. It was a lesser degree. Now this is it. So now we're seeing some, some finality, some totality, that there's no recovery. The Bible says that every living creature in the ocean or the sea died. Every creature died. Then he goes to the rivers and the fountains, and they became blood. And he said, I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. I'm in verse 5. And which art and must and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. One translation says you gave them the blood to drink because that's what they were thirsty for. So they had shed the blood of innocence, they had martyred the people of God, and so now God said, you wanted to shed blood, now all you're going to have to drink is blood. As I was reading this, it made me think of a dream that my grandma had many, many years ago. I was, I was very young, but it was a dream that people talked about my whole life. And in this dream, and I'll tell it just very quickly, but my grandma had a dream of a race car driver. And some of you have heard me tell this before, but she had a dream that this race car driver, he, he was loved racing. He would never go to church. He believed in God, but he would never go to church because he always wanted to race. And he was continually fixing up his race car, and making it nice, and always putting things into it, and racing. And 
He said, I love you, God, but man, I just, I got a race. I'll serve you later. I'll serve you later. But I, I, I got a race. This is my life and this is fun and, and I love it. And in that dream, the race car driver died. And when he went and stood before the Lord, the Lord had a golden race car. And the race car driver said, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is what I always wanted. You gave me my heart's desire. Uh -oh. And the race car driver got in his car and drove the car off and he burst into flames and he was in hell. And the race car driver cried out and said, God, this isn't what I wanted. You misunderstood. This isn't what I wanted. And the Lord said, that's what you wanted. That's what you will forever have. Jesus. Church, if God is not what we are hungry for, All right. 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 eventually he will let us have what we're chasing after. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We see the picture of it here. These people were thirsty for blood. And in judgment, they got exactly what they were thirsty for. Yeah. I don't want anything to come between me and God. Is driving a race car a sin? No. Is having hobbies and doing things a sin? No. But church, we've got to make sure that we seek after him to satisfy our heart. Right. That we seek after him to satisfy our life. <clears throat> and that we don't put anything before him. One of the very first commandments that he gave was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when something gives us more pleasure than what God gives us, when we give more attention and more energy and more affection to something other than God, right. Come on. then we are putting that before God and making it a God of our own, an idol of our own. I want to be careful that I don't become so hungry for other things that in, in eternity, that's what I'm stuck with for the rest of my life because I chose it over God. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had the power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. They repented not to give him glory. So they had this great heat. Al Gore wants to talk about global warming. One day there's going to be global warming, but it's not because you didn't drive a Prius. Right. But there's going to be global warming because an angel is going to have access and there's going to be great heat that comes upon the earth and it's going to be so hot that people curse the name of God. Right. I don't know how hot that is. A few years ago, I did a wedding outside and it was 108 degrees out. It was the hottest I've ever been in. The wedding cake was actually melting. The icing was dripping off the cake. The groom's grandmother had a heat stroke. It was just pitiful. Pitiful. We went to Lake Michigan a few years ago. The sand was so hot, it blistered our feet. So I don't know how hot this is going to be. But I believe it's going to be hotter than 108 degrees. But it's going to scorch the earth. And it's going to scorch men with great heat and it's going to cause them to curse the Lord and to blaspheme his name and they're not going to repent remember by this time their hearts are hardened they're not going to repent the wrath of God is not going to turn them to repentance the fifth angel poured out his vial in verse 10 upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the name of God because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So now we see where the Lord uh, directs the darkness directly to the seat or the center of the Antichrist's kingdom. Now, it could be worldwide, but we know that epicenter of where the Lord concentrates this is on the kingdom of the Antichrist. Because he said he poured it on the seat of the beast. And that doesn't mean the literal seat where he was sitting, but where he reigned from, where he ruled from. And so he poured out darkness there. Now the Bible says that when they poured out darkness, they began to chew on their tongues and gnaw their tongues because of the pain. I'm reminded of it, <clears throat> excuse me, in Exodus, when the Lord poured out the darkness, the Bible says the darkness was so thick and heavy that they couldn't move. It was like a weight upon them. It wasn't just dark outside with no light. 
It was a heaviness. So think about this. They have sores that will not heal. They've been scorched with heat. So the worst sunburn you can ever imagine. And now they have a darkness that is so heavy upon them that it would be like if somebody come up and smacked your sunburned shoulder. Mm -hmm. Right? And so now the pain was so bad that they were gnawing their tongues for pain. And they blasphemed God again. Now again, church, this, we are not appointed to this. This is not supposed to be us. We are appointed to be redeemed. And if we obey the gospel, this will not be us. But these are people that survived the tribulation, that took the mark, and people that are still here and going through this. I don't want to be a part of this. This is not a gospel of fear, but this is a gospel of redemption. We are saved from this. The Bible says that he provided a way of escape. That we should be counted worthy to escape the wrath to come. Verse 12. says in the sixth angel. Poured out his vial and the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up. And the way of the kings of the east might be prepared for it. So now the river Euphrates is drying up. We read about the river Euphrates in Revelation 9. It's drying up so that there's a clear path. For the kings of the east to invade the Holy Land. They're going, to, they're going to use that path and they're going to invade the Holy Land, Israel. And it says in verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Not everybody that works a miracle is right with God. If you want to know if somebody's right with God, don't look at the miracles they work. Look at the gospel they preach. Yeah. Right. Look at the life that they live because the devil can work some miracles too. Mm -hmm. It says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. What battle? The battle of Armageddon we see in verse 16. And he gathered them to the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And so it's, if you translate that out, it means the place of slaughter. The place of slaughter. It's located somewhere in northern Israel. Um, the explorer Napoleon called it the natural battlefield of the whole earth. In other words, for him, it was, the, it was a natural battlefield. It was, it was the best place on earth to fight a battle. And that's where Armageddon is going to be fought. Verse 17 said, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of the temple saying from the throne, It is done. So the seventh angel is getting ready to pour out his vial, and he heard the voice from heaven saying, It is done. Church, one thing I want to mention before I move on is remember what we just read about the seven or the, the spirits that look like frogs. They were the ones that instigated the war. What does the Bible tell us? That we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness? When you're in a battle with your brother or your sister, don't fight that battle <clears throat> with words and Facebook posts and texts. Don't fight that battle with gossip and trying to divide and get people to pick sides. But when there's a war going on between the people of God, it is instigated by spirits that are motivating our carnality. Come on. Come on. And the way you're going to win that battle is not with carnality, but in the spirit. When you're at war with somebody, pray. Pray for your deliverance. Pray for their deliverance. Take authority over any spirit that might be motivating your carnality. The devil studies you. Yeah. He knows what you react to. He knows what your triggers are. Yeah. And he'll put those triggers in front of you. He'll put those temptations in front of you. It's just like, I, I'm, not, I'm not tempted to eat mushrooms. No. Don't like them. So you can put them before me all day long. I ain't going to eat them. Yeah. Mm. Now you put some chips and salsa in front of me. You put some cake in front of me. You put other, and you're going to tempt me. The devil knows what your triggers are. He's not dumb. We call him the stupid devil or the dumb devil, but he's not dumb and he's not stupid. Yeah. Right. He knows what your triggers are. And he'll put those things in front of you to 
Get your carnality and your flesh raised up. So when someone rubs you the wrong way, and now all of a sudden you're fit to be tied and you don't have any peace and you're just aggravated and you can't get your mind off of that situation, who do you think started that? Right. So if you want to fight it, pray. Worship. Take authority over it. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, mm -hmm. to the casting down of imaginations, that we take every thought and we lead it captive to the obedience of Christ. When I got thoughts running through my head that are stealing my peace, you know what I do? I grab a hold of them. And I'll say, whatever the thought is, maybe it's, maybe it's a thought that I think Brother Noah's mad at. And I'll say, I'll just grab a hold of it and I'll speak truth to it. And I'll say, you lying devil, I know he's not mad at me. I know he loves me. I know he's praying for me. I know you're just trying to steal my joy and my peace. Now I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Right. What do I do? I speak truth. I lead it captive to the knowledge and the obedience of Christ. Right. Speak truth to those thoughts that are stealing your joy. All right, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial. He heard a voice from heaven saying, it is done. Verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as not been since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. So the last one was an earthquake that has never been before. There's never been an earthquake like it in the history of the world. It says that the great city was divided into three parts. Most people believe this is speaking of Jerusalem. It was divided into three parts. And the cities of nations fell. So all across the world, great cities of nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Babylon is going to be judged and the fierceness of his wrath. They're going to be forced to drink it. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. You know what that means? Islands disappeared into the ocean. Right. Mountains were flattened. That's how powerful this earthquake is. And there fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, about a hundred pounds. Anywhere, I found in my studies that it could be anywhere from 95 pounds to 125 pounds. But every piece of hail weighed that much. Now, two summers ago, there was a hailstorm in Huntington, and the hail was the size of the palm of your hand. And that hail in one county did over $12 million worth of damage. Imagine hail that's 100 pounds. That's the size of, one of some of our kids. And we could, we could go through and look at a kid and find out there's a kid probably in here that weighs 100 pounds. And that's how much the hail would be. Now, they tell me, I've never done it, but they tell me that if you would drop a penny off of the top of the Empire State Building, yeah. that when it hit somebody, it would kill them because of the force. Yeah. So imagine hail, 100 pounds crawling from the sky. Imagine the destruction that would do. God is extinguishing the beast, the harlot, and the dragon. We're going to see in chapter 17 and 18 the destruction of what God is pouring out. Again, this is not God angry necessarily with man. He's, he's angry with the Antichrist and his rule, but he has to extinguish those that took the mark, those that followed that system. Church, we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in following the systems of this world. Right. That we don't follow the mindsets of the world. Right. Part of taking the mark of the beast was worshiping the image of the beast. Yeah. Now, many times we think of it being an actual image, but it could be image as in the spirit or the mindset of the beast. One, one translator actually says that it's talking about the system of mankind because it is the number of man. We need to be careful as saints of God that we don't put the wisdom of man above the knowledge of his word. Right, right. 
There are going to be times where the president, where governors and mayors and elected officials and even other religious leaders will tell us things that are contrary to this word. Come on. If somebody tells us something that is contrary to this word, we have got to refuse it. Yeah. We have got to stand on the word of God. It's not about popular opinion. It's not about surveys. It's not about who, uh, what, what makes more sense to the mind. But it's about trusting the word of God. Yes, amen. We had our business meeting on Monday and we talked a little bit about finances. And one thing that I had shared with our leadership team is that God spoke to me last year that if we would increase our missions giving that he would bless this church the wisdom of God says if you want to be blessed if you want to if you want to have an increase give more All right. that doesn't make sense you talk to financial advisors and they're going to tell you stop giving and start saving mm -hmm. the wisdom of man most of the time is contrary to the wisdom of God right. But we increased our missions giving, and in the middle of a pandemic, we had our best financial year ever. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we increased our missions giving. All right. Take the counsel of God. It might go against what everybody else is telling you, but if you'll take the counsel of God, you'll be blessed. Yes. This book is not just another book. It's not just a book of stories, teachings, or ideas. But this is the word of God. Yes. You don't think we're in an age right There's a church out there. I just saw the website this week. That they claim to be Christian. In Tennessee. It's not in California where you just met. In Tennessee, part of the Bible though. They don't believe that this Bible is the word of God. But yet they call themselves Christian. You don't think we are very far away from a generation rising up that doesn't know God. Right. If we stop preaching, if we stop teaching, if we stop taking this word for what it is, the very next generation could be that. Brother Moreau could be your grandchildren and mine. I'm not, as long as there is breath in my body, Amen. Come on. I will make sure that right. every generation knows All right. that this is the word of God. Right. And that there is a name above every name yes. that will save us from sin. Right. And that name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have prepared a way of escape for us. Lord, that we can be counted worthy, that we can be born again of water and spirit, have our sins remitted, and the spirit that raised Christ from the grave will take us in the rapture. God, help us to prepare ourselves to be ready. Lord, we don't want to miss when you call your bride. We want to be a part of that wedding ceremony. God, I pray that you bless each one. Give us wisdom and knowledge. Help us to take heed to your word and not be led astray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You're dismissed for a time of fellowship. Rest your break. We'll come back at noon and start our worship service.